Hello and welcome to the Sibsey West Midlands Region CPD webinar on Carbon Steel Tube The Basics. Today's event will cover uh, and be introduced by uh, Chris Owen at Tata Steel, its products and its sustainability focus. Uh, we'll cover why not all tubes are the same and the differences between their hot finished tubes and cold formed and other imports. Uh, and we'll also cover welded versus seamless and the advantages of welded tube. Dr. Chris Owen, our speaker today, is a customer technical services manager at Tata Steel UK in the building and industrial services tube products. He's the chair of the BMTFA, the British Metals, Tubes and Fittings Association Technical Committee, a member of BISA, the Brick Building Engineering Services Association Affiliates Committee and Pipework Working Group, Chris is proactively promotes the benefits of carbon steel pipe work and product specification awareness within the building and industrial services. Just a few housekeeping tasks before we get started, if I may. Uh, please keep your cameras and microphones switched off until you'd, last to like, uh, until you'd like to ask a question. And bear in mind that this session will be made available on YouTube and our podcast for people to catch up with afterwards. Alternatively, please use the chat function to ask any questions during the presentation. A copy of the presentation slides should hopefully be available after the event. Uh, CPD certificates will be sent automatically afterwards once I've checked you in via the, your registered contact details. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you all for joining us for today's session, but also to thank Chris and the team at Tata for sharing with us what they have today. I'm really looking forward to hearing it. Over to you, Chris. OK, thank you. So hopefully you can still see my screen. OK, yep. so um, as um, we've just explained, the objective for today's CPD is really to give you a bit of an introduction of, of Tart Steel, its products, uh, sustainability messages. And again, whilst all carbon steel tubes may appear to look the same, there's actually some fundamental differences. So we're going to touch on the changes in legislation, the standards, what we call technical delivery conditions, and also then talk about the different manufacturing processes, which can have a big impact on, on both how the tube performs, but more importantly, how you comply in terms of uh, construction products regulations or even the pressure equipment directive. So very quickly, you know, who are Tata? Um, you may have heard of us previously as Chorus or British Steel. We're now Indian owned. We've been operating uh, with Indian ownership for, uh, for over a decade now. We are um, quite a diverse organization in terms of the different types of, of products which we manufacture. I work for the tube side of the business. And as you can see from the slide, there's a whole range of different uh, sections and sectors which we look at. I'm basically responsible for what we call the sort of construction fit out area. So basically building services. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, similarities with, with the tube manufacturing processes and, and what we do in terms of technically promoting our products for the other market areas. Um, but really, because building services is seen as being quite specialised, that's why there's a dedicated technical resource to support our, our customers and, and, and marketplace. I suppose one of the things I'd like to try and highlight, and I've been doing this job for about 16 years now, is that we do see uh, a lot of change in terms of, of building services. Um, you know, the specifications around the sort of pipe work, which can seem to be quite traditional in their nature, has changed over the years. And uh, it has caused a few issues in terms of projects, compliance, sign off, um, because a lot of people are not aware that those standards have changed. Um, so really, one of my main roles as a customer technical services manager is to support the industry and make sure that people are aware that you know different pressures, different temperatures, different ways of manufacturing the tubes all need to be taken into consideration when you're doing your pipework selection. We manufacture in the UK. Um, we basically have a number of, of brands which we promote in the market, mainly Install Plus and Inline 265, which I'll explain a little bit more as we go through the presentation pack. But you can see the little schematic there, which shows that the building, we've got you know quite a lot of different applications within the building itself, but also we're seeing our products being used more in the infrastructure, tunneling, um, part of dig out, part of the fit out. And, and again, you can see we have large dam to pipe work and small dam to pipe work. When it actually comes to um, the sort of technical specifications, you know, we have two manufacturing sites in the UK. All the steel which we use is actually made in Port Talbot and Wales. And we tend to be able to manufacture to particular standards on particular sites. So for Corby, uh, our, our, our 
basically install plus gas list standard what would be the old 1387 which people sometimes refer to that's what we make here where i'm based and then we have a larger pipe mill up in hartlepool which does a lot more of the industrial process pipe and this is where in building services you might hear people making reference to medium weight heavyweight well that would be the install type product so the the bs 10255 uh, and when they talk about API, it's the larger diameter products. And again, this is the first sort of indication that uh, there's something not right with the industry because you're referring to legacy specifications here. So we're going back many decades where, you know, people used to specify red band, blue band in terms of the pipe work. The standard at the time, the BS1387, used to only go up to six inch, 150 nominal bore. So then when people wanted larger diameter risers, the only other pipe work which was readily available in the market at the time in the UK would have been there to support the North Sea activities or American specifications. So this is why you sort of see this sort of legacy of people asking for Shed 20, Shed 40 API for pipe work, which is going into European projects. And, and this is why we're having to basically make sure that the specifications are correct, because if you're asking for an American product, and you're using it in a European or UK project, which then has compliance in terms of construction products regulations or the pressure equipment directive, you can't really use an American product because it needs to be harmonized with the European standards. So we do see a, a need to either ensure that the specifications are tidied up or that they refer to the relevant standards to allow pipe work to be approved for the job it's being installed into. And, and you can see, um, you know, this is some of the sort of risks which we, we we come across when we're working with specifiers and end users. Normally, the pipework specifications is is legacy. It's out of date. It's cut and paste from previous projects. So people haven't amended the right specifications. We also see that there'll be carbon steel tube defined as a, a 10255 or 10217. And there'll be no reference to the other parts of the standard, which I'll explain in a few more slides, is a real big issue because those standards and the various subcategories are defining exactly what type of carbon steel and how you want it delivered. We we always see um, a very restricted use of, of the standards reference. So most of the time when we look at somebody's project specification, big chunks of actually what they need to be putting in there in terms of grade, technical delivery conditions, whether it needs to be harmonized with a particular type of legislation or directive are, are normally missing. And it's important to make sure that those bits of the specification are actually captured because when you look at the applications which we sell into and where our products are used they can be quite varied in terms of compressed air low temperature hot water high temperature um, systems steam systems sprinkler systems gas systems and whilst these can all be satisfied by a carbon steel tube it's about making sure the specification is correct because the different types of carbon steel tubes exist as a result of the specifications the standards and the manufacturing process and I think that's very important to uh, highlight because this is a, a piece of work which was done through the trade associations when we all started talking about, well, what is building services? We worked with um, BMTFA, which is the British Metal Tubes and Fittings Association. We worked with BISA, Building Engineering Service Association. And we've done, obviously, conversations with SIPSI as well to basically say, well, these are the typical applications, these are the typical temperature ranges, and these are the typical pressures. And you can actually see um, the ones which have highlighted, there is a, a noticeable change in the type of, uh, of demand which the um, tubes can be exposed to. And this became a bit of a problem in the UK market um, because people weren't aware that carbon steel tubes can be manufactured differently. And this is where people start referring to cold form or hot finished or, or, or warm in some cases. And, and this is really down to the fact that you know, a carbon steel tube can exist in many grades. It can go through manufacturing processes in a variety of different ways. And as a result of the heat treatment process, it can end up with different characteristics. And the heat treatment process is quite critical because when you produce a tube and we produce our tube by a coil based method, then basically you end up with a welded area. And I've got some more videos and schematics which explain this, but you end up with a, a cross section of the tube, which has what we call a heat affected zone. And that is technically a cold form tube. So it's an area of, of, of changes in stress, um, increased brittleness. So basically it's an area of weakness. When you look at a hot finished product that goes through a heat treatment process, which allows the heat affected zone and the stresses associated around that area to be removed. It gives you a consistent product, it gives you consistency in terms of its uh, mechanical properties, and it's obviously a better product in terms of the amount of work hardening it can undertake before the risk of splitting. 
and I won't go into all the details because there's information which will be supplied or can be supplied after this presentation. But really, you know, we we manufacture both hot and cold products, um, but we only put hot products into the building services because of compliance and also because of the type of basically behaviour um, which people expect the products to be able to to their performance when they're being manipulated. So in building services, you'll see tubes being bent, you'll be seeing grooved, threaded tubes. Uh, and again, if you have got a poor quality carbon steel, which has got a lot of stress around that sort of weld area because it's cold form or hasn't been heat treated properly or the right temperatures, then you can obviously see the, uh, the risks there with tubes starting to split and fail in service. The problem you've got is a lot of people, when they look at the technical specifications, will look at what is the old legacy standards. They've been replaced with new European standards. And what you can see from the table there is you've gone from uh, sort of four standards to, to more standards because as the standards have further developed, they've become basically, I would say, more complicated in that people have tried to issue more standards or more technical clarifications to try and clarify whether products are suitable or not. But you can clearly see from the manufacturing types, tubes can be supplied welded, they could be supplied seamless. And then when you started looking at the delivery conditions for welded, they can be cold formed, they can be hot finished. This then starts to get into what I call those technical delivery conditions, because when people are normally specifying they want a tube, nine times out of 10, we see somebody ask for 1387 or they may ask for 10255 but they're not actually defining whether it's a, a hot finished tube they want, whether it's a seamless tube or a welded tube. And then when we go on to the technical delivery conditions, you could then start seeing that actually when somebody asks for carbon steel, if they're not really defining all these other characteristics, then you're not really sure what they want or whether it's suitable for the applications that they're, they're for the intended use. So this is why when we work with end users and specifiers, we sort of look at the high work specifications, which are either still referring to legacy standards or referring to the current correct standard, but they're just missing the rest of the information. The analogy which we tend to use when we talk to consultants is you've just walked into a bar and you've asked for a drink. So you don't really know what you're going to get, because if you want the right drink, you've got to basically tell them that you want a, a wine, a, a large, a Chardonnay. And then basically, you know, the barman knows exactly what to give you. The same is true for, for sort of carbon steel. You know, if you just basically say, I want a carbon steel tube, it's like, well, okay, great, we can give you that. But actually, do you want one which is to this specification? Is it going to be cold form? Is it going to be hot finished? Is it welded? Is it seamless? And what grade do you want? Because different grades, different strengths of, of steel tubes now exist. And what type of certification? Because it, it needs to be harmonized with particular reg regulations or directives. So this is why we're we're doing a lot of work in, in promoting the um the correct use of specifications. And as I say, if you look at the sort of manufacturing um process, this is what we employ for our uh, carbon steel tubes made in the UK. So we take the coil, which is manufactured in Wales. So we've got that traceability, that consistency. Again, because of the concerns about Russian feedstock getting into the supply chain, because we make all that steel ourselves, we control that. But basically, you know, the coil then gets welded into this sort of tube profile. That is a cold form process. Um, the advantages which we have with a hot finish process is we're able to make um, parent hollows. So what happens is that if you want a cold form tube, which is four millimeter thick on its wall, then you have four millimeter thick coil. If it wants to be five and a half millimeter thick on its wall, then you need a five and a half millimeter thick coil. What we tend to do is we have a master thickness and then we can heat that parent hollow up and stretch reduce it to get all the different sizes, wall thicknesses and shapes which we need. So it gives us a lot more flexibility in terms of manufacturing process. But more importantly, because it's going through that heat treatment process where the tube will be seeing temperatures in excess of 950 degrees C, we're removing all those stresses and the heat affected zone as a result of that welding process. So we're producing a tube which is not only suitable for majority of the applications uh, because of the way we manufacture, that it's complying with the relevant standards. But again, it's got those areas of concerns, those weaknesses removed as part of that manufacturing process. And in Corby, we use a full body normalizing technique. In Hartlepool, we can use what's called well line annealing, where we're able to apply the heat, but we just apply it locally. Because the tubes are a lot bigger and tend to go from 8 inch up to 20 inch in diameter, then of course, you know, we, we do have 
furnaces which can heat the tube up um full body normalization but of course that's obviously adds a lot of time and effort and cost so again for the types of products we can manufacture and the markets we sell into the standard allows us to do heat treatment either by full body normalizing or the weld line annealing and for the smaller sizes it's more effective to use a furnace treatment and for the larger sizes the weld line annealing now what i've got here is a a, a video of you can see that so this is the um, manufacturing process which we have at Corby. Um, so what you can see as we go through the video is the sort of typical setup which we have. So this is our coil which is being delivered from Port Talbot. It's in what we call slip widths. So different coils will have different chemical compositions depending on the products which we're manufacturing. And those coils are then loaded into our mills. What happens is it's a continuous process. So we, we weld the the nose to the tail together so we've got the continuous feed into the mill and you can see what's happening is the coil is now going through the forming station so we're actually forming it into that tube profile so this is putting stresses into the wall and then we go through the heat treatment for the weld so actually we don't have any filler material we have what's called a high frequency induction coil so this causes the free edges of the, the strip to superheat and we squeeze that together that's what makes that weld as a result of that molten material being pushed together we have a weld bead so we just trim that off both on the outside and on the inside and then we go through our first part of non-destructive testing so this is eddy current and ultrasonics and we obviously take sections for destructive testing as a stretch reduction process, we have a parent hollow, which is 168.3 OD, and it's about 125 meters in length. Um, we then blow that tube out and it's then put into a furnace. So we have um, at the moment at Corby um, gas barrel furnaces. We have 30 of those which take the tube from ambient up to about 850 degrees C. And then we go through induction furnaces, which then take it up to the uh, 1000 degrees C, depending on what type of stretch reduction we're doing. We'll talk a little bit more about the, um, the gas furnaces later when we talk about sustainability. When the tube comes out, um, you can see that it is um, red hot. And then through the induction coils, it basically gets up to that high temperature. So it's cherry red. And then that allows us to put it through the stretch reduction process. So we've got diameter going in and smaller diameters coming out. And that gives us a lot more flexibility in producing you know, awful lots of different shapes and profiles. Everything in building services is round, but obviously in structural construction, we have squares, rectangles, ellipticals. So what happens now for the building services products is we put it into primary finishing. So because we've gone through a heat treatment process, we obviously want to cut the tubes to the right size. We then straighten the tubes. Uh, we also do additional non-destructive testing. So those tubes then go through, again, a full body EC test. And again, this is just making sure that there's no defects or areas of concern within the, uh, the tube. That full body uh, NDT is basically the leak tightness testing. We'll also periodically take sections of the material away. Um, they'll go to our QA labs where we'll do, again, destructive testing, tensile tests, micro hardness tests. Once the tubes have gone through primary finishing, they then basically are ready to go into what we call secondary finishing. So this is um, where the added value is added. So depending on what the market or the customer wants, tubes will then be galvanized, they'll be painted, they'll be threaded, they'll be grooved. They might be cut to additional tighter tolerances depending on the, uh, the customer requirements in full. But most of the products which we manufacture in the UK market will basically be our red painted install plus. And I say this goes across a, a dedicated flow line and the paint which is applied originally was just a transit protection but because we now see people installed in a not top coating uh, we've improved the paint quality so we've got some very good humidity and salt spray results on this paint and that just allows people then to install it as is uh, without having to worry about trying to work a height to repaint products um, and then obviously the other thing which we've got in terms of the the product once it goes through the paint line is we pick up a, a product marking on there as well so that gives us some traceability if we do lose that traceability the fact that we've been able to manufacture the product using our own steel means that we can analyze any material and confirm whether it comes from uh, ourselves or not um, port Talbot or any steel maker when they basically make their, uh, their, their raw material always have some sort of steel DNA. So we can do a, a cast analysis and, and it'll be able to confirm exactly what, uh, what tube that is and whether it's ours or not. 
Now, at the moment, a lot of people will be saying that they supply products which are equivalent to ours, um, but but they're not. Um, and this is one of the things which we're trying to focus on now to make sure that people are aware that look, they may look like a you know a, a red metal straw, but actually there are a lot of differences in terms of how that steel is made, where that steel comes from, the sort of traceability work which goes on in the background, the physical testing. So so we've seen a lot of competitor products, and really when we've looked at the you know, the technical information or or what their their product is 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 actually achieving in terms of its mechanical performance, then they are different to what our products are. So we work with a lot of specifiers and end users to try and promote the the brands. Um, so say the red painted product which comes from Corby, we refer to as Install Plus two three five. So the two three five is the minimum yield. Uh, it's a product which has been in the market for many decades. It's got a very good reputation for being very robust and very reliable. And, and again, one of the things which we really enjoy about this product is it, it's supplied in a, a, a standardized range of, of ODs and wall thicknesses. So, so unlike um, products which we sell into Europe, which can have a, a huge range of different ODs and wall thicknesses, it, 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 the UK is very, very standardized. So it means that we're producing sort of products of, of similar dimensions, and that means then that people got the right fittings, which are always available, and they're just used to working with these sizes. For the um, more demanding or larger scale um, applications, then we would tend to use our, our inline. And the install is an installation tube. The inline is line pipe. That's where the API comes from. This product is available in a lot more different uh, sizes, but we just tend to focus really on the sort of shed 20, shed 40, so I a medium weight and a heavy weight. We can manufacture more different wall thicknesses if need be, but we tend to see in the UK market for building services, again, it's more of a standardised approach. Um, whilst we can make this product in the Corby size range, we tend to find that Install Plus meets most of the requirements for building services. So we tend to sort of recommend that they go with the red painted for six inch and below and then go for the inline for the larger sizes. One of the things we have been doing is obviously promoting the benefits of these higher grades of steel. So by default, we see a lot of people over engineer some of the pipe work. They tend to go for the thicker, heavier walls. But actually, because the grades now are so refined and there's more higher strength grades available, it does allow you to go to a thinner, lighter tube and still meet the same sort of pressure and service life integrities. In fact, that's one of the things which we're really focused on now in terms of, of pipe work advice, because we really want to try and make sure that people are aware of the sustainability benefits. So at the moment, we do know that there's a, a big driver for sort of carbon neutral products. We, as a steel maker, obviously produce an awful lot of CO2. We've got various activities which are underway now to reduce those CO2s, including some uh, uh, in setting schemes, but basically we can supply a product into the marketplace now with up to 90% embodied CO2 removed, but we can also do certain things to help get to that journey of, of net CO2 by looking at the design. And obviously there's things which we can do in terms of manufacturer, which I'm just going to quickly touch on now. So as part of that manufacturing process, we can see there's huge areas of opportunity for us to get CO2 out of that process. So again, the steel make is the key area, but as tubes business itself, there's a lot we can do in terms of the conversion or normalizing and also how we get the tubes into the market. Um, if we look at the um, the main area of focus when it comes to our decarb strategy, that's obviously Port Talbot. And there is a roadmap in place and there is a commitment to reduce our CO2. Uh, what's happening at the moment, and you've probably seen this in the news, is various discussions going on with the government about its sort of energy policies and its industrial strategy. Um, we at Port Talbot have the option of moving to either hydrogen uh, or electric arc or a combination of both. And there's various things which we need in place um, in terms of, of infrastructure support from, from the UK government. So hydrogen is obviously going to be a more environmentally friendly gas to use, but obviously a lot of hydrogen needs to be produced and a lot of energy is used to produce that hydrogen. So we need to understand what's happening in terms of renewables. And also in the UK, as a steel manufacturer, we are actually paying more for our energy compared to a lot of our European competitors. So it's about understanding what the government's going to do in terms of its energy strategy. If we move to an electric arc, then that allows us to use a lot more recycled scrap material, almost 100%. The problem is, though, in the UK at the moment, we don't tend to segregate the steel sufficiently, and a lot of our steel is exported for scrap. So again, we need to understand what sort of infrastructure is being put in place to allow us to make sure that the right steel is being segregated. So when we actually are making steel using an electric arc, 
process, then obviously we're getting the right properties. And what we don't want is to have poor quality steel in that because then that'll basically have a knock on effect to producing a, a poor quality product, which is something which we don't want to do. So there's lots of work which is going on in the background to agree these strategies. And uh, and obviously, and whilst that's happening, there's still a lot of CO2 reduction going going um, ahead because we're investing in new kit. We're, we're being a lot smarter of what we do in terms of our resources and the energy and the way we manufacture. Um, one of the things which we um, obviously are able to um, promote is the fact that we're integrated. We're making that steel ourselves, that, that we've got full control of that that process. So we know that there could be um, people making claims that they're getting steel with low CO2 from the open market. But again, there isn't really that traceability in place at the moment to guarantee that. So because we're making the steel ourselves, we know exactly what our CO2 is. And we also know, again, made reference to this previously about the, the no risk of any Russian steel getting into supply chain. You know, the UK has a melt and pour policy. Um, so again, we're able to control all that. When it comes to our raw materials, then yes, a lot of those raw materials are being obtained from outside the UK, outside the EU in some cases. Uh, but we are BES 6001, so we're a responsible um, sourcing of materials. Um, so basically, we're trying to make sure that any impact which we've uh, created as a result of um, taking raw material out of the ground has been uh, addressed. And again, you can see um, as part of the manufacturing process, you know, we, we do use an awful lot of, of, of raw materials. Uh, but if we then move more towards an electric arc in the future, it allows us to basically look at other schemes where we can basically take our current material back and recycle it for reuse. But we've been working on this for, for many years. Um, we look at all the different sort of um, processes and uh, all the different um, activities which we've got in place um, to basically show that as a, a producer of CO2, as a steel manufacturer, we are moving in the right direction. And, and these are just some of the examples of some of the things which we've signed up to. The important one is obviously the EPD, because again, when people are now asking for our um, CO2, we've got um, fully validated reports which can be issued. And then that's quite important because that's allowed us to benchmark where we currently are and then what we can do year on year is show the reductions which we're achieving as a result of the um, CO2 decarb strategies which we've got in place. And one of the biggest things which we were able to do with all that investment and that carbon reduction is launch a carbon inset scheme, which is called Optimus. Um, and this is basically allowing us to apply sort of carbon credits to existing products to allow us to reduce the um, embodied CO2 by up, that, up to 90%. So this is a scheme which um, Optimus stands for zero port Talbot emissions. So basically it's an independent uh, validated scheme. Um, what it allows us to do is all the investments which we put in or all the projects which we've got in terms of reducing the um, the impact of CO2, we're able to get carbon credits. And those carbon credits can then be applied to particular products, uh, which allows us to issue certificates, uh, which basically gives us a CO2 reduction. Uh, some future developments we're looking at is actually have sort of eco CO2 reduced tubes as standard. But at the moment, the way we work is we'd work with the end user to understand what type of product he was taking, how much CO2 was involved, and what type of CO2 re reduction he wants. And an inset is different to offset so we looked at all the various schemes available and what we didn't want to do is just basically say look at us aren't we good we've planted a tree somewhere that doesn't really solve the problems in terms of getting the co2 out of the emissions at root source so that's why the inset scheme basically being validated by dmv and what it basically says is look you know, we can clearly see from the audits that we're putting money in and investing in reducing our co2 as a result of those carbon credits, we're applying it to particular products, which allows us to promote those as being CO2 reduced. Uh, the money from the sales of those products then goes immediately back into further decarb strategy. And eventually, at some point, Optimus will disappear because we'll, we'll be carbon neutral. Um, whereas on the inset scheme, people are planting trees sorry, the offset scheme, people are planting trees and, and not really addressing the, the sort of root cause of the, the pollution. So that's why the inset is always going to be seen as being better option over, over the two. 
and at the moment we're we're working with a number of consultants and end users to um to get this uh, in place say we only launched it to the beginning of the year and uh, say some of the feedback we've had so far is is very positive so we do see particularly in building services there is a bit of a desire to have a reduced co2 in pipework systems um and that's that's really positive because i think building services has the opportunity of moving a lot faster on this compared to uh, other parts of the construction industry. And what is quite important to um, point out here is um, this table just gives a, a, an example of the current CO2 levels we've got and how much it can be reduced by applying the Optimus. But if you also look at the differences in the weight and the CO2 from a heavyweight tube to medium weight tube, you can then see also that a lot of, of CO2 can be reduced by having a more efficient design. So taking advantage of some of those higher strengths of steel. If we look at an example, um, this is something which was um, which we've been working on as a project. So basically we were looking at taking almost 214 tons of, of embodied CO2 out. And again, you know, we mentioned some other um, conversion, normalizing dispatch. So, so again, you know, it's a shame that we do these CPDs online. Ideally, we'd like to do them at the work so we can take you around, show you the mills. But for Corby, we're, we're physically cutting our site in half. We're going to a much smaller manufacturing footprint, which basically allows us to get rid of old assets, old buildings and reduce our, our, our site CO2 levels. We're also getting rid of older mills and putting more efficient new mills in, which again allows us to reduce our CO2 levels. Um, we showed you the video which showed you all those gas barrel furnaces. Well, they're in the process of being taken out and we're putting induction furnaces in place. Eventually, we'll have no gas on the site. It will be uh, purely induction uh, furnace. And obviously, that energy used for that can be offset with renewables. We might consider having hydrogen uh, at Corby if there's a cluster put in close by. Uh, at the moment, there isn't uh, one which has been guaranteed. However, at Hartlepool, there is a cluster which is going in. So, so they're looking at obviously utilising induction, but more importantly, looking at utilising the hydrogen since it's going to be available in the area. And one of the things which we um, also like to promote, and we've seen this being requested more and more on certain projects, is the actual road miles to journey time. Because we're manufacturing in the UK, you know, basically we've got short legs compared to something which has been manufactured in China or further afield and being transported halfway across the world into the UK. So again, your know, product is, is, is a very short supply chain leg. You know, the steel is made in Wales, the tubes are made at Corby and Hartlepool. They're then sent to our customers, who normally the likes of Wolseley, BSS, Ashworths, NTS, who all got distribution centres quite local to us. And then they've got branches which are supplying almost immediately into the project. So, so again, you know, the, the actual transportation of the finished product is is very um, very well understood. And as I said, short design leg in comparison to something which has been imported from from across the world. Um, the sustainability commitment. Um, for us at the Choose Business, we have these sort of four main areas, but the one which I wanted to sort of just remind people of is, is what we can do in terms of, of the design of the products. You know, we mentioned very early on in, in the CPD, but we tend to see a lot of specifications being out of date, a lot of sort of thick wall tube being specified because people are concerned about corrosion allowances. We're basically saying that, look, there's a huge opportunity here to look at your pipe work system. You know, we are manufacturing carbon steel tube and have been doing that for many years, many decades. Over the years, the standards have become more refined, the steel has become more refined, the welding technology has become better. So, so you can actually have you know, traditional products now which can last you know, many, many, many decades. They don't have to be over-engineered. You know, it might be quite strange to hear a steel supplier saying, we don't want to sell you as much steel, but, but we just need to be smarter about the resources which we've got. And we certainly see, again, in the larger sizes, people asking for shed 40 tubes, where a shed 20 tube can be used. And we've done all the calculations to show that there's still um, you know, enough material there for pressure integrity, even with corrosion loss. But most people aren't seeing those corrosion losses anymore because the systems are being monitored. There's better understanding of commissioning. There's better understanding in terms of use of inhibitors. Um, so, so you know, we're, we're sort of saying actually, when you're looking at your your sort of carbon reduction journey or your pipework specifications, talk to us because there's things which we can do to get you on the right spec and also the right walls, and that could have a weight saving, a cost saving, and it will have a CO2 saving. 
one of the other things which we're doing is a lot of the small diameter pipe work is sold into the market screwed and socketed so again threaded joints historically have always been the way people have put the tubes together but we now see all these mega press type fittings groove couplings mechanical couplings so we've asked a question of all our suppliers and end users sort of saying well do you still use those sockets because we're going through the process of making a steel tube we're then basically making it into a socket half the market thinks that socket's a thread protector so they throw it away the other half the market thinks well actually it's not the right thread we need or the right fitting so replace it anyway so so we're going to just basically supply tube into market just screwed no sockets uh, and a little thing like that when we've looked into it, has a huge impact in terms of the energy and co2 we're, we're part of our production process um so so again talking with people about you know the different techniques which now exist you know there's been uh, quite a lot of of new developments in terms of compression fittings and uh you know mechanical grip rings which which were really well and able to take standard building services pressures and temperatures um we touched on the um the sort of product development activities which we're doing with the eco for applying the optimus so again optimus is available now uh and again we've uh, we've been doing some work with a number of of uh, customers particularly around london where there seems to be a, a big focus on on the co2 reduction and also around sort of birmingham liverpool area as well where we've got clients building clients now who really want to basically a understand what pipe work is going into their building so they know it's the right material and b understand what sort of benefits that pipe work is bringing in terms of reducing the building co2 one of the things we're very keen on doing also is is the reuse of products most of our products going into building services are demountable types of joints which are being used therefore you know if you've got a product which is being used um within a, a building and the client wants sort of 20 years and we're able to guarantee this product for 40 years if he's then repurposing that building or reusing that building for something else and needs to change the pipe work that pipe work can be used elsewhere um so so we're happy to work with uh, end users and specifiers to make sure that you know if they want they can go to much higher grades of, of steel to give them that additional um durability and extended service life so those tubes can be reused again and where we see uh, a good opportunity of taking both the way out and bringing again uh, a UK product into into use is where seamless tube is being used. Now nobody makes seamless in the UK anymore, and most of the European manufacturers are also moving away from carbon steel seamless. So seamless is really coming in from from far east. Uh, it tends to be again over engineered um, because of the way the seamless tube is made. It's a billet of steel which is heated up and then extruded so it tends to wobble a little bit when it comes out so you end up with inconsistencies on the obality and inconsistencies on wall thickness so so people might not know exactly where the thinning on the wall is so so spec a slightly heavier pipe work that also gives some end matching uh, disadvantages when you come to basically weld these tubes or join these tubes together so a welded tube is more consistent in terms of its obality more consistent in terms of its wall thickness and because you know that consistency you're able to calculate exactly what your pressure integrity is based on the thinnest part of the tube because of that that tighter control good end matching for welding or jointing so so we do a lot of work where basically we're able to say look you know a welded tube is is more than suitable to be used as a an equivalent comparative alternative to an imported seamless product in most of the applications within building and most within industrial the only time we would say use a seamless is if you're going to really high temperatures and really high pressures but nine times out of ten, most of the applications which we see, you know, a, a UK manufactured welded tube will be fine. It, it sort of shares the same steel grade number. It goes through the same testing. Uh, we trim it so there's no internal uh, well bead. And other than the sort of slight differences in temperature, um, and that's because as the tube is extruded out, the grain structure is aligned more so we don't suffer from creep. So that's why we would basically say that a welded tube can go up to 400 degrees and the seamless tube go up to 450 but nobody is really operating at those temperatures within standard building services okay the other thing which we've been um doing is obviously working with uh, various universities and uh, trying to improve the knowledge of the students who are going through building service courses or engineering courses um in particular we've done a lot of work with Loughborough university and cranfield university we have an initiative in place which is called bispa which is the building industrial services pipework academy and this is about working with um again originally it was all around bim 
partners working with um, end users and with uh, the manufacturers to try and make sure that we supply the right products, the right CPDs are in place. Uh, this is a basic CPD, but the more uh, advanced CPDs start talking about galvanic corrosion reaction, the issues when you start mixing sort of carbon steel with stainless steel, uh, the problems which you may have with um, mixed metal hybrid systems and the commissioning of those systems. That's something which we'll talk about in other CPDs. But the information which we're getting and the work and the technical information which we put into the marketplace is all being validated through these collaborations we're doing with the universities. And more importantly, the trade association. So I mentioned BISA and BMTFA. You know, we've worked with these um, two trade associations to produce a pipework selection tool. Um, so again, if you go on to either BISA or App Store uh, or into the BMTFA website, there is a pipework selection tool which the industry has worked um, collaboratively together to basically allow people to go in, select the application, and then it will produce by default a sort of text sub. It will basically go through the options which are available in terms of the pipework material which is available, whether you want copper, stainless or carbon steel. Then it will ask you the type of uh, jointing systems which are available for that particular application. You can adjust the temperature and pressure range and see what stays in, what falls out. And then it will basically give you a, a summary of, of the standards you need to be specifying, the technical delivery conditions, and more importantly, it will tell you who manufactures them, and more importantly, where you can get additional um, help and assistance from. So I would, um, we we actually look at the app in a little bit more detail in the uh, the next CPD, but if you are interested in that, uh, I would go to the, um, to the website at BMTFA now, because there's some other training literature, um, other information on there, which you might find of use. Most of the manufacturers are, have put um, content on there to support both tubes of different metals and, and the different fitting types as well. And, and it's really good because it's allowing people to have the right awareness in terms of how they specify both the pipework and the available fittings in terms of not just saying I want this, actually putting together the right technical description to ensure that when you get um, that product to site for that application, it is fit for purpose and ticks all the boxes. And that's really what we've been doing. Um, you know, uh, uh, Tata is 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 trying to get uh, more engaged with the market, work more closely with end users. Uh, we have been doing work with Sibsi in terms of developing um, product um, um, data templates. Uh, we see the sort of PDTs as the sort of ideal way of allowing us as the different manufacturers to come together and have a standardised approach to putting technical information into the marketplace. We always see ourselves as being slightly different from the competition because of the guarantees, the compliance focus, which we have, the technical support, the UK manufacturing and the focus on sustainability. Um, so this is why we're trying to make sure that when people are looking at, at carbon steel tubes, they do realise that there are differences, you know, both in terms of traditional. We also have talked about thin wool. Um, that gets covered in another CPD because obviously there was a lot of issues associated with thin wall and there wasn't a problem with thin wall as such. It's just the lack of understanding of how they needed to be installed, how they need to be commissioned. Um, so we, we do see um, problems with with pipe work legacy, uh, wrong specifications, not having the full awareness of how to uh, install the differences between the manufacturing techniques, which can have differences in mechanical performances. Um, we then obviously build more and more on the on the information which we've covered in this CPD. We have an intermediate and an advanced, so we can really go into the science for those people who are interested. But today it was really about just giving a, a very simple overview. Uh, I know there was a lot of uh, slides the pack will be made available. But really what we want to try and do was, again, just introduce you to Tata Steel and our UK manufacturing, uh, give you an overview of the types of products which we, we, we make. Uh, certainly you can see, or hopefully you can see, the big focus on sustainability and what we can do in terms of more efficient designs. But we obviously have our CO2 reduction strategies, both within Port Talbot for the steel make and downstream businesses within the tubes. Uh, we have the Optimus, which allows us to provide you know, the carbon credits and even further CO2 reduction. Um, the tube specifications was quite important. You can see by just specifying you know, a legacy standard, you leave yourself exposed because of the different manufacturing types. We don't see people really specifying the, um, the full technical delivery conditions correctly. So, so we do a lot of work making sure that, you know, those grades and those quality designations are, are also listed within specifications. And again, that's important because as you can see from the different manufacturing processes and the different way that the tubes behave, you know, you're more likely to have um, compliance issues or um, 
installation fabrication challenges with with some of the cold form products and technically a cold form tube can only be used up to 50 degrees c um not covered under the pd anymore so that's why we multi-certify so people can clearly see exactly what they're getting and those changes um with cold form tube happened in 2019 so so you know by now uh, people should be made aware or should be fully aware that that certain products which they'd used previously are no longer suitable and the reasons for those changes were not driven by tar steel it was driven by the european standards it was a seamless manufacturers who made the first um, changes to their specifications that's because that cold form tube can use different grades of steel um and also don't go through the same type of testing so there's issues around ductility low temperature suitability and when you look at the standard the part one standard which is the cold form tubes are supplied to the standard clearly states that it's an ambient room temperature standard only so it's not suitable for elevated temperatures where your mechanical properties do change as a result of the temperature increase so these are things which hopefully um you're now made aware of if you need any further assistance then my contact details are are included in the pack and we're happy to basically um, work with um, SIBSI and, and, and the members to look at technical specifications and advise whether they're correct or not uh, or point you in the direction of other resources which are available for you to uh, to use to make sure that your uh, pipe work specs are, are correct and you reduce any risk of the wrong material being installed in your project thank you excellent well, uh, that was really interesting and informative. Thank you very much, Chris, for that. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank everybody who's joined us for doing so today. It was great to have you with us today. Thank you. But I'd also like to thank Chris and the team at Tata for sharing with us what they have done today too. Uh, our next event is being held on the 11th of July, which is our ventilation and indirect adiabatic cooling webinar and seminar. And as Chris mentioned, there are some opportunities for further learning programmed in you can find out more about carbon steel tubes on the 26th of September for our intermediate knowledge session or on the 24th of October for our advanced level details. Sign up to attend and benefit from our uh, via for our Eventbrite page, uh, which I've just popped into the chat. Uh, you can also catch up with uh, some of our events by subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, which I've also popped into the chat and uh, any feedback thoughts and comments are welcomed by emailing feedback at sibsywm.org does anybody have any questions for chris really no okay well uh, as uh, thank you very much chris um and uh, thank you for sharing contact details oh there's there's just one in the in the chat that's just popped up from uh, Douglas, uh, which is what opportunities are there for reusing and recycling tubes? So, uh, hello, Douglas. I know Douglas quite well. We've had these conversations. <laughs> so at the moment, um, we obviously trying to understand where the government's going in terms of the, I mentioned it on the electric arc, you know, the scrap industry. So if the electric arc industry and the scrap associated the refinement of that material is put in place then we can look at using more and more of, of the steel which we make to make more tube um that that isn't in place at the moment so we would look at um on particular projects whether there is an opportunity of us revalidating and recertifying our products for reuse that is an option and we're happy to sort of talk and work with people um to just see whether that is something which can be uh, undertaken uh, we're also trying to increase the recycled content of our steel, but because we make the virgin steel, we, we only go to a certain level before we start losing some of the mechanical properties. So, so really, you know, for me, it's about looking at the design. It's looking about what we can do in terms of demountable systems, how those systems can be recertified. And at some point, hopefully in the not too distant future, we'd be looking at either take back schemes or working with others in the industry to be able to take more of our product back. And hopefully through an electric arc process, we'll be able to basically use almost all of that material up to 100% uh, to turn it back into, into, into new tube. But again, I do feel that there's an awful lot we can do with the amountable pipe work for recertification and reuse which would then obviously not mean that tube had to go back and go through the whole manufacturing process again uh, but we're very early days we're in the uk unfortunately uh, lots of discussions going on lots of emotion as you probably hear in the news because uh, people look at uh, you know, electric arc is, is a good way for us to move forward as a, as a, as a business. Uh, but obviously people then think that that's us making less steel. Well, no, we're just being a little bit smarter about the steel we are making and try and get more use out of that steel. Um, but of course, it's all to do with the, 
the government and the industrial strategy and the energy strategies. Um, but I think, you know, for me, there's opportunities now. I hate using the term low hanging fruit, but but there's stuff which we can do now working with each other to define the right pipe work specifications and the right walls. So if you're using the right tube, it's sized correctly, then there's a huge benefit there, not just on the pipe work, but on the system as well. Excellent. That's great. Thank you for that. Uh, well, if there's no other questions, I uh, hope you all have a good re remainder of your day and look forward to welcoming you to a future City West Midlands Region event in the near future. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you. Thanks both. Thanks, Joss. See you soon. <clears throat>